Hello, and welcome back to Missouri Civil War. In March 1865, Brigadier General Clinton Fisk noted the transformation that years of civil war had wrought upon his district in central Missouri. The Union officer was particularly struck by the far-reaching consequences of emancipation. The decline of slavery dealt a massive blow to Missouri's master class. The economic impact can hardly be exaggerated. As tens of thousands of slaves fled to freedom, masters lost millions of dollars as their largest asset, aside from the land itself, was now simply gone. The war also brought revolutionary social change. Living among free people of color, some of whom now held positions of power, was a new reality for many white Missourians. Outraged at the disappearance of their antebellum world, whites lashed out with black, at blacks with violence and terror. As a result, a large number of former slaves fled to safety in St. Louis or beyond the state's borders. Wrote Fisk, slavery dies hard. I hear its expiring agonies and witness its contortions in death in every quarter of my district. Today we continue with the enlistment of African American soldiers and their crucial part in this transformation. The war triggered major demographic shifts and altered the racial landscape of Missouri for generations. We consider the story of Spotswood Rice, who illustrates the transformation of Missouri in a powerful and intimate way. And finally, we conclude with the meanings of equality, freedom, and justice, and the prospects for African Americans in a post-war Missouri. The Civil War triggered a social revolution. As Aaron Astor argues quite persuasively in his book about Missouri and Kansas called Rebels on the Border, there were four ways that the enlistment of black troops played a crucial part in changing this state. First, the number and the proportion of former slaves from Missouri who joined the army surpassed those seen in almost every slave state. In Howard County, Missouri, for instance, almost two-thirds of the adult male slaves entered military service. What these men did was to take away vital labor from slave owners, some of whom were Unionists, but many more of whom were Confederate sympathizers, and to give to the Union a more powerful weapon with which to combat guerrillas and other rebels, some of whom were their former masters. Second, the speed with which former slaves joined the military hastened the disintegration of slavery. In December 1863, a local provost marshal reported to John Schofield that a, quote, stampede of Negroes, end quote, had come to enlist. Sometimes they came on their own. Sometimes they came in groups. In January 64, seven of John White's slaves, Adam, Alfred, Andy, Jacob, Preston, Sam, and William, all enlisted together at the Fayette recruiting post. You might wonder, how did slaves come to know of these opportunities that lay beyond their master's households? Most slaves, after all, could not read or write. Missouri law forbade teaching slave children. Many historians, however, have revealed that slaves were nonetheless intimately aware of the developments around them. According to former slave Henry Clay Bruce, uh, who had come from Sheraton County, news passed from mouth to ear and from farm to farm. Even within bondage, slaves in Missouri had enjoyed some geographic mobility. The hiring of slave labor between white households was common, and the personal connections forged within these extended social networks helped to spread news about Union troops, freedom, and opportunities. Third, the roles, the roles that African American soldiers played within Missouri further illustrated the social revolution underway. Um, and what I mean by that you have people who had just recently been held as slaves, now helping to implement the punitive terms of that 1865 state constitution. In Lafayette County, uh, near Lexington, black troops arrested two pro-Confederate judges who refused to surrender their offices according to the recent ouster ordinance. And lastly, the military service of African Americans showed how the Civil War had become a war of liberation. It remained a war to save the Union, but black troops recognized that victory now also meant the death of slavery. Furthermore, their enlistment gave them a powerful claim upon civil equality, including the right to vote in the post-war world. Now, the story of Spotswood Rice. In 1862, 
Congress passed a militia act that freed black soldiers' wives and children who were still held by rebel masters. This act, however, did not extend to Missouri and other border states, and it would not until March 1865. Recall that the second Confiscation Act, which had been passed in 1862, only freed the slaves of disloyal masters, and Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation did not extend to Missouri. By 1863, enforcement of the notorious Fugitive Slave Law had been suspended. Swelling numbers of African Americans took it upon themselves to escape. In November 1863, John Schofield gave his approval for the enlistment of men who had once belonged to loyal masters. Upon enlisting, many of these soldiers used their newfound power to liberate enslaved family members, by force if necessary. One such soldier was Spotswood Rice. He enlisted in the 67th Regiment of the U.S. Colored Infantry. Although Rice gained his freedom, his wife and children remained the slaves of the Diggs family near the central Missouri town of Glasgow. Rice's former master tried to bribe him in return promising him land and a house if he would stay and manage the farm's affairs. You can see both the varied approaches that masters would use to keep slaves from enlisting, in this case economic incentives and suggestions of greater autonomy, but in other cases brutal intimidation and violence. In the Army, Rice worked as a military nurse and was assigned to Benton Barracks Hospital in St. Louis. By September 7, 1864, his wife, Ori, and five of their children had made it to safety in the city. Two of their daughters, Mary and Cora, remained as slaves of Kitty Diggs. Spotswood and Cora agonized over their daughter's fate. They pleaded with Union officers to intervene on their behalf. Spotswood himself wrote to Mary and Cora to assure them that he had not abandoned them. Be assured that I will have you if it cost me my life, he wrote. Federal troops, he warned Kitty Diggs, were heading up the Missouri River to set his children free. On September 3, 1864, he wrote Diggs directly, I want you to understand that Mary is my child, and she is a God-given right of my own. And you may hold on to her as long as you can, but I want you to remember this one thing, that the longer you keep my child from me, the longer you will have to burn in hell. He concluded, My children is my own and I expect to get them, and when I get ready to come after Mary, I will have about a power and authority to bring her away and to execute vengeance on them that holds my child." We know that Diggs, presumably outraged at this affront, forwarded Rice's letters to Union Commander William Rosecrans and demanded that Rice be sent out of the state. Yet the efforts to free the Rice children were successful, and the whole family was soon reunited in St. Louis. Look online for the WPA narrative from Mary Rice, which was taken in her 80s, and how she describes Spotwood's, Spotwood's saga and the emotional power of this transition from slavery to freedom. By the end of 1864, the collapse of slavery in Missouri was nearly complete. In many ways, the emancipation order that Missouri delegates passed in January 1865 merely acknowledged the new reality. There had been almost 115,000 enslaved people in the state back in 1860. By the war's final winter, a great many of them had seized upon the chaos and violence to claim their freedom. In short, they ran away. Not all of them, sure. Missouri slaveholders long insisted that their human property was faithful and loyal and contented. And you can find examples of slaves who chose to stay near their former masters. The guerrillas who rode with William Clark Quantrill, for example, hailed Sam Jackson as the model of loyal servitude. Jackson, they said, had helped to conceal and provision guerrillas in the nearby woods, and when Union soldiers burned his master's home, Jackson rushed to save the family Bible from the still smoldering ruins. As Diane Muty Burke shows, slavery in Missouri took a different form than it did on the vast plantations of the Deep South. Unlike the Cotton Kingdom, small slaveholding households were much more common in Missouri. In these situations, there was a greater intimacy between master and slave. They were more likely to work side by side, either on the farm or within the home. Such intimacy cut both ways. 
Could it make possible the kind of affection uh, that Sam Jackson seems to exemplify? Perhaps. Yet it, that very proximity also led to terrible abuse, physical, emotional, and sexual. I would argue that Sam Jackson was an exception to the much larger pattern that swept across Missouri, in which tens of thousands of slaves took their freedom into their own hands. The turn toward emancipation alienated conservative unionists. In August 1863, the provost marshal in Lexington noted that many erstwhile unionists felt betrayed. Hundreds of men who were it not for the Negro would be union men are now very doubtful, he wrote. Many of them make the preservation of the institution of slavery a condition precedent for their support, effectually identifying their interest with the rebellion. By that point in the war, there was no turning back. Hundreds of loyal slaveholders petitioned the federal government to compensate them for their losses with little success. The Civil War remade the racial landscape of Missouri. As they escaped from slavery, huge numbers of African Americans fled the Missouri countryside, uh, never to return. Along the borders with the free states of Illinois, Iowa, and Kansas, you see a remarkable decline in the black population from 1860 to 1870. In Little Dixie, the wealthy central counties, which had the largest numbers of slaves, the African American population fell by almost 20% uh, during that decade. Where did these free people go? Many fled the state altogether, but a large number went to St. Louis, where the black population surged by 325 percent. Over the same time, the rural to urban shift triggered by the war gained even more momentum, and it would continue through the late 19th century. Uh, a large number of African Americans moved from the country into Missouri towns to find greater safety in numbers. The danger of marauding vigilantes, uh, the kinds of uh, slave patrols that had taken shape during the war, persisted. In addition, there were, were at least a few all-black communities that took shape in places like Pennytown. The threat of racial violence remained widespread after the war. Unlike the Deep South, there would be no occupying federal force in Missouri to police the countryside. I want to close this lecture by posing the question that faced free people as they looked toward their future. What did freedom actually look like? This was a powerful idea. What did the reality mean? Did freedom simply mean the absence of slavery, as many white Americans assumed? Or did freedom also require political equality, regardless of race? Did that also include voting rights? A great many African American leaders in Missouri and beyond believed that the answer to both of those questions was a clear yes. Some also argued for a measure of economic justice, saying that generations of enslaved people had, through their blood, sweat, and tears, earned a claim to land. Some radical Republicans in the U.S. Congress, like Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, agreed and said that defeated rebels ought to be stripped of their plantations and the lands redistributed to former slaves. Yet most white leaders, including many Republicans, did not support that. On July 9, 1868, the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified, recognizing the equality before the law of all people born in the United States. Barely a decade earlier, Chief Justice Roger Taney had issued his notorious Dred Scott ruling, saying that blacks had no rights which whites were bound to respect. In 1870, the 15th Amendment gave African American men the right to vote. Neither of these landmark cases came without an intense political struggle. Missouri voters rejected black suffrage by a two-to-one majority, and racism remained deeply entrenched. Historians describe the dozen years that followed the Civil War as Reconstruction. For many African Americans, Reconstruction unfolded in a very personal fashion. It began with the rebuilding of families, torn apart by sale and separation, sometimes many years distant. As racial segregation deepened in Missouri and much of the nation, the African-American community in Missouri turned inward, focusing upon its own institutions, especially the church uh, and the school. We can see one example of the former in the case of Spotswood Rice, who became a successful minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Perhaps the most famous example of the latter was the founding of Lincoln Institute in Jefferson City. 
uh, a college that was started with the key support of former black troops. Unfortunately, it's beyond the purview of this course to reckon with post-war history in great detail. But I would urge you to read more about this period, which has been unfortunately neglected and forgotten by many. An excellent place to start would be Eric Foner's uh, masterful Reconstruction or any of the other suggested readings. So many issues that America deals with today, whether we mean racial tensions or disagreements about the proper balance of power between the states and the federal government, they go back to this era. And I would argue that you can't understand the United States today without first understanding its history from 1865 to 1877. For next time, we come to the end. In it, I'll introduce some of the legacies of Missouri's Civil War and the ways that memories of that time uh, resonate in the years that followed. Until then.